Okay, so let's take a look at the um, final of our three videos on criminal courts. And I have to say, this is a busy canvas. There's quite a bit of writing on this, so I apologise for that. It, you don't need to know most of the writing because most of it's legislation. I'm just putting it up there so as you can see it, you can see where it's written, and to perhaps give you some steer as about one of those pieces of legislation that you perhaps might want to download and have in your portfolio. And remember again, I'm just going to repeat it, I'm going to repeat it at the beginning of every, these are easy marks. Please make sure that you spend the same amount of time that you do looking at these as you do at looking at mens rea and actus reus, um, because they will guarantee your UMS marks. I intend to do some videos in the future about um, how to get the best from the examination system, and it will involve getting the most marks in the, in the easiest of places. And this is one of the places in which you can do that. Criminal courts are easy marks. So this is the last one and it's all about sentencing. What happens? We've looked at the um, different types of court and the different types of appeal. We've looked at how we get from committing the offence and charging to court. We're now going to look at what happens when people are found guilty. What happens with sentencing? And our starting point are the aims of sentencing. What are the aims of sentencing? Uh, and I quite like this video here from the famous cartoonist Mac with the judge sort of jump in for joy because he's got a chance to find somebody guilty. The aim of sentencing is that it's got to be fair. All right, once the defendant is found guilty, the court must decide on the sentence. So you have the arbiter of fact and the arbiter of law, and the arbiter of law is the person that decides on the sentence, and that's going to be the court, and in this case, the judge. And there is a requirement for consistency. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to consider consistency. Because consistency leads to public confidence. Remember we said that when we looked at the procedure rules, is that if everybody is confident in the system and the public are confident in the system, then there will be an element of um, people feeling that they can be happy and comfortable being judged by that system. The range of sentences that are available are dependent on type, seriousness, and circumstances of crime. All right, so you've got a range of sentences that are available and they're dependent on the type, the seriousness, and the circumstances of the crime. And the guidelines and sentences are decided upon with a number of traditional theories in mind. So when a judge decides, or a magistrate, what type of sentence they are going to give, those types of sentence are given with some traditional theories in mind. And I'm going to spend just a few moments looking at those traditional theories. And I've helped you out here with a mnemonic. I've put them in order. A mnemonic, this is a pride of lions. And this, of course, is Roger Rabbit. So the mnemonic is pride Roger Rabbit. P R I D. E -R -R, Pride Roger Rabbit. And our six, there are more, but these are the ones that we are going to concentrate on. Our six sentencing theories are prevention of crime, retribution, incapacitation, deterrence, rehabilitation, and reparation. Reparation means giving money back, paying back. And I'm going to spend some time looking at some of these in depth. And there is frequently questions on what are the different types of sentence in theory. So knowing them, again, is a key to getting good marks. Our starting point for this is to look at the Criminal Justice Act 2003, another piece of legislation. And section 142 of the Criminal Justice Act says that the purposes of sentence are to punish offenders, okay, top one, reduce crime, rehabilitate offenders, protect the public, and make reparations by offenders to people affected. So it's very clear, legislation now tells judges about what they should consider when they are deciding on what type of sentence that they need to use. And we're going to look at some of those types of sentence. The first is retribution. And retribution is just about punishment. Retribution says, in short, 
If you do something wrong, you should be punished for it. Simple as that. The only reason, the only theory of sentencing should be, in retributive terms, straightforward punishment. Retribution, of course, attracts criticism from liberals who see that it's barbaric, and you can see here a form of retribution that is barbaric, and that it has no place in a civilised society. But the problem with retribution is it meets with public approval. The public like criminals to be punished. It's publicly accepted and most governments generally tend to put retribution high on their, their, um, their sentencing uh, legislative mandate. And they do so because they know members of the public like it. A discretionary life sentence, for example, has a core of both deterrence and retribution, before which a prisoner may not be released even if he's no longer a danger to society. So you've got a discretionary life sentence, so the judge can offer a discretionary life sentence, which is deterrent and it's retribution. And it says that a defendant cannot be released even if he no longer poses a danger to society. Now this is linked to the Old Testament idea of an eye for an eye. Okay. And although an eye for an eye no longer plays a part in our criminal law, um, it, does, it does underpin the concept of retribution. So, next one, deterrence. And deterrence works on two levels. It works on an individual level and it works on a, as a general level. And the general level is where things like strict liability helps. So, for instance, I might be deterred from killing my wife because I know that if I do, I will go to prison for life. That deters me from doing it. But generally, having a sentence, so people cannot, I don't know, take what they want from shops, generally will stop all society stealing from shops. And we've already looked at strict liability, and one of the key reasons for strict liability is to give a general sense of deterrence. It's to stop all of society doing a particular, um, a particular act. Prevention of crime as a theory, is that they're about protecting the public. If you prevent people committing crime, they, then you are protecting the public. And the idea is that prisoners cannot re-offend in prison. So prisoners cannot re-offend in prison. In prison. The problem is, of course, and the argument against it, is if you keep people in prison, they are unemployable when they come out, because whether we like it or not, society sees prisoners in a particular way. And if they are unemployable when they come out, they are more likely to return to crime. So... As a, as a theory, you've got to be quite careful about how that is being used. And the final one that we're going to look at is the one of rehabilitation. And this helps to overcome problems. It helps people to overcome problems. It helps them to avoid reoffending. And it tries to integrate people back into society. It tries effectively to cure the offender. It gives them skills. It can also give them things that they need like anger management. It allows them, perhaps teaches them how to drive, so driver training. It gives them education. So there are a number of reasons why rehabilitation might be a, um, a and, and is a very frequently used punishment theory. All right, so we now need to, I needed to find it, but I now need to find the types of sentencing. Let's go all the way to the top up here. So, types of sentence. And I've done the same thing. All right. 
I've looked at the CCF, so that's the CCF, and that's a down and out. All right, combined cadet force down and out. Types of sentencing, C, C, F, down and out. There are custodial sentences, there are community sentences, there are financial sentences, there is a complete discharge, and there are other sentences. A custodial sentence is quite obviously one that looks at prison. It's incarceration. And the key piece of legislation here is section 152 of the Criminal Justice Act 2003. I introduce you to that on the other side of the video page. So a custodial sent penalty is imprisonment up to a certain maximum, which may be life. Um, in, the sentence, in the case of murder, it is a mandatory life sentence. And it's possible for the most serious of offences. Where no maximum sentence is specified for a statutory offence, it's taken to be two years. So not if it's not specified, it's taken to be two years. And custodial sentences are governed by sections 152 and 225 of the Criminal Justice Act 2003. And it says very, very clearly that the court must not pass a custodial sentence unless it thinks that the offence or the combination of offences was so serious that a fine or community sentence can be justified. So it says that it has to be blooming serious, all right, before you send somebody to prison. And then it goes on to say that life sentences are a prison for public protection for serious offences are important. So if a person aged 18 or over is convicted of a serious offence, or if the court is of the opinion that there is a risk to members of the public, then the court should consider very, very strongly a custodial sentence. So it says on the one hand, 152 says it's got to be really serious before you send somebody to prison. And then 225 says that public protection is one of those really serious reasons. Now, first offenders, let's get some rules. First offenders are not normally imprisonment, imprisoned. Right, so first offenders are not normally imprisoned unless they are serious cases. So murder, of course, would have to be. Rape would have to be. GBH with intent would have to be. But the use of imprisonment has been increasing. England and Wales had 142 people out of every 100,000 behind bars in early 2005. And the latest figure, which is uh, the latest one that I'm using, so let's have a look at some numbers. Let's write these down. So in um, 2005, they were 142 per 100,000 people behind bars. In 2007, that number has risen to 150. Now that eight people might not seem very much. I'm going to try some complex maths here. So that's eight people per 100,000. That means we can times that by 10, that equals 80 per million. There are 60 million people in this country. So um, let's do that, that's 64. So that's 80 people times that. So I make that something like, that's a lot of people, 6,400 prisoners more over the course of two years in prison. Okay, so you can see that the, the, the just the small, that small increase demonstrates that how serious this issue is. So what are the alternates? The alternative sentences are things like community. A community sentence may be imposed if the offence is sufficiently serious and may take serious form. So it's still going to be quite serious to have a community sentence. They might have a community rehabilitation order. Too many long words to write. So they may have a community rehabilitation order that used to be known a probation order. All right. And that's between six months and three years. 
And there are often conditions placed on a community rehabilitation order as to the place of residence where somebody is supposed to live, participation or non-participation in certain activities, and attendance at a probation centre or perhaps treatment for drugs or alcohol abuse. They may be given a punishment order. And that might mean that they do community services and that's up to 240 hours community service and that's unpaid work in the community or these two so the community rehabilitation order might be combined with a punishment order but not with any other penalty so you can put those two together but you can't have any other penalty in areas where there are adequate monitoring arrangements a curfew order may be made restricting the defendant's movements between 2 and 12 hours per day but that has to avoid clashing with work, education or religious commitment. And that can be up to a period of six months. So, for instance, if somebody came out of prison and was given a job, then that's a positive thing. You would want them to work because people who are in work are unlikely to commit crime. Education and work are seen as key social um, preventors of crime. So therefore you would not want to give somebody a curfew order during the, the hours of the day that prevented them going to that work. Or even at night if their work involved night shifts for instance. There are also financial sentences and a financial penalty gives a fine up to a certain limit. Okay, so it gives a fine up to a certain limit. And that may be imposed for various statutory offences if they are serious enough. And there might be unlimited fines for other offences. I appreciate my handwriting is really bad on this. Although the fines that are imposed must not be excessive compared to the offender's means. It is completely, so you have to take means into account, it is completely useless giving somebody a £100,000 fine if they exist on benefits and welfare benefits. And fines are imposed in about three quarters, so fines are imposed in about three quarters of all non-motoring offences tried summarily. So fines seem to be the most likely sentence in a summary case. And it, that rises to 90% in motoring cases. So they're the commonest penalty. So these are by far and away the most common penalty. Even indictable offences lead to a fine 30%. So 30% of indictable offences lead to a fine. There's time to pay, which is normally up to about a year which is allowed if the offender requests it. Then we want to look finally in terms of our, our um, types of sentence at the discharge. And there are two, there is an absolute discharge and there is a conditional discharge. And that might be up to three years. And it, will be granted, a discharge will be granted if the court thinks that punishment is unnecessary. It does not count as a conviction. Let's get that written in there. It does not count as a conviction for most purposes unless the defendant wishes to appeal against it. So, how are, the, how are sentences selected? Have I got a little slide for that? I don't think I do, do I? Yes, I do, down here. How are sentences selected? They will look at a number of things. The court, when they decide how to select a sentence, will look at previous convictions. How many previous convictions that are similar, generally, has the defendant committed? The court may offer a or they may ask for a pre-sentence report for the most serious of offences. And this will be prepared by the Prohibition Service. 
An office, a, a probation officer will interview the defendant. So these are all linked, these three, will interview the defendant. And whilst this is going on, the defendant will be on remand or on bail. So they might be kept in prison if it's a dangerous, if they consider to be dangerous, or they might be allowed out on bail whilst the pre-sentence report is being um, put together. And in the pre-sentence report, the things that will be covered will be, why did the defendant commit the offence? What is their attitude to the offence? What is their attitude to the victims? Were there other factors that affect in blameworthiness? So that might be things like, um, if it was a violent crime, what about their home life? If their home life was a violent one, that might affect their blameworthiness of, of um, a violent crime. And is there any harm of um, a risk of harm and reoffending? So the courts will look at all of those things before they decide what sentence to use and the level of sentence. Finally, I'm going to look at two other issues. One is aggravating factors and one are mitigating factors. And aggravating factors make the sentence more serious. So aggravating factors will give a more serious sentence. The first of those are pre-convictions for similar offences. If somebody has committed 16 thefts and is convicted for another off offence of theft, that means that the judge is likely to have a more serious or more severe sentence. And remember, this is only going to be used after guilt is proven and on sentence. This is only going to be used when the judge is thinking about the sentence. If the offence was committed whilst the defendant was on bail, that will be an aggravating factor. It will mean that it will give a more serious sentence. If it is an offence that is based on religious or racial hostility, or if the victim is vulnerable, that will cause more serious sentencing. If it's a gang attack and it's part of a gang, um, a, 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 a gang attack, then that is more likely to attract a more serious sentence. If there is an abuse of a position of trust. So, for instance, we've seen a great number of cases recently in which teachers have had relationships. And one famous one where a teacher took a um, student away to France. That was an abuse of a position of trust and that will lead to a more serious sentence. If a weapon was used or the attack was repeated. And if the defendant was under the influence of drink or drugs. But don't forget that can also serve in some extent as a defence as well as a, an aggravating factor. So these are the things that will make a judge give a more serious sentence. They're called aggravating factors. And finally, the judge can also, the judge or the magistrates can also give a less serious sentence, can make the offence less serious if they are mitigating factors. So is this the first offence that somebody has committed? Is the defendant one that is very old or one that is very young? Is the defendant vulnerable? Are they easily influenced? Have they expressed remorse? Have they said sorry? Have they offered to compensate the victims? Do they come from difficult home circumstances? And have they made a guilty plea? I'll talk about guilty plea in a minute. Let's just look at the last two, difficult home circumstances. All of us remember the dreadful, dreadful James Bolger case. Both of those young, um, well, those that, that were eventually found guilty, Venables and Thompson, both claimed that they had come from difficult home circumstances, which made them um, more likely to commit violent crime. And that might be taken into account by the judge. And thirdly, those defendants that plead guilty get a reduction of their, their um, sentence. So they get a third 
if they, at the, if they plead guilty at the first opportunity. So their sentence is reduced by a third if they plead guilty at the very first opportunity. If they plead guilty when the trials start, they get a tenth off. And the idea is, in order to save time, effort and money, if somebody pleads guilty at the soonest opportunity, then the court will recognise that in the sentence. And again, very, very frequently, particularly AQA, often ask questions about what are the factors from the scenario that might aggravate or mitigate the sentence that the judge imposes. So, that is a long and hard work video. There's an awful lot of information in there. I didn't want to break it down because it all fits under one key area of sentencing. So please work through it. Please learn those key areas. What are the theories of sentencing? What are the types of sentence? Why does a judge choose a particular type of sentence? And what might be aggravating and mitigating circumstances?